Hello everyone, my name is Beck Gruss. I'm the director of Valley Arts Center, which is where you're at, um, if I don't already know you. Thank you so much for coming tonight. We're super excited um, for our speaker tonight, but first I wanted to thank our sponsors. Uh, we are supported by Ohio Arts Council, Ohio Arts Council and Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, and also our sponsors for the current exhibit right now, which is Contemporary Debris, um, is Premier Bank, TKM, and KC Monda Art Advisory, so we thank them for their support. And if you enjoy tonight's um, art talk, uh, we sure could use your support as well. So thank you for considering. We have little QR codes around, um, but thank you so much for coming tonight. I'm gonna turn it over to Julie. Hello, I am Julie Polsonelli. I am the Assistant Director and the Gallery Manager here at Valley Arts Center. Uh, I just wanted to go ahead and introduce my friend Sydney here. So Sydney Slakis is a stewardship specialist at the Cleveland Museum of Art. She completed her undergraduate education at the South Carolina School of the Arts in Painting and Drawing and attended both law school and graduate school at Case Western Reserve University, earning a JD with a concentration in Law and the Arts and a Master's of Art in Art History and Museum Studies. She presented her paper, Male Torso, a Manifest a manifesto of gender loss in a fragmented whole at the 46th annual Cleveland Symposium and has numerous publications in the Cleveland Museum of Art's critically acclaimed blog, The Thinker. So I met Sydney when she was assigned to me as a mentor at Case, and since then we have worked together quite a bit in the CMA galleries, and I'm excited to hear her talk tonight. Thank you. <laughs> to speak with you all today. Um, let's just jump right in, shall we? All right, get my clicker here. Oh, Julie. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. The term ready-made was first used to describe fashions and clothing that were not handmade. Beginning around 1760, products as a result of the Industrial Revolution soon began to be mass-produced for the benefit of the public through machine processes rather than hand production methods. This, as we know, is a definitive turning point in the history of humanity, which has given rise to unmitigated access to material culture, at least in the West. Nice. <laughs> the art historical origin of the ready-made is a bit harder to define. As it is known to us today, the ready-made is a term used to describe prefabricated, often mass-produced objects isolated from their intended use and elevated to the status of art by the artist choosing and designating them as such. The term assisted ready-made refers to works of this type whose components have been combined or modified by the artist. But when did this phrase enter the vernacular of art historians? And who coined the term? There's no definitive answer for these questions, but by exploring the use and history of ready-mades in art history, we can begin to peel back the origins of conceptual art as we know it today. Mm -hmm. We cannot discuss the history of ready-mades and conceptual art without discussing Marcel Duchamp. Born in Germany, Duchamp was the son of a notary and a younger brother of painter Jacques Villon and Cubist sculptor Raymond Duchamp Villon. He studied at the Académie Julian between 1904 and 1905. His early figure paintings were influenced by Matisse and Fauvism, but in 1911 he created a personal brand of Cubism combining earthy colors, mechanical and visceral forms, and the depiction of movement which owes as much to futurism as to cubism. His new descending a staircase number two, 1912, created a sensation at the 1913 New York Armory show. In the years immediately following World War I, Duchamp found success as a painter, but he soon gave up painting entirely, explaining, quote, I was interested in ideas, not merely visual products, end quote. Marcel Duchamp was a pioneer of Dada, a movement that questioned long-held assumptions about what art should be and how it should be made. Dada, or Dadaism, was an art movement of the European avant-garde of the early 20th century, with early centers in Zurich, Switzerland at the Cabaret Voltaire in 1916. New York Dada began around 1915, and after 1920, Dada flourished in Paris. Dadaist activities lasted until the mid-1920s. Developed in reaction to World War I, 
The Dada movement consisted of artists who rejected the logic, reason, and aestheticism of modern capitalist society, instead expressing nonsense, irrationality, and anti-bourgeois protests in their artworks. The art of the movement spanned visual, literary, and sound media, including collage, sound poetry, cut-up writing, and sculpture. Dadaist artists expressed their discontent towards violence, war, and nationalism, and maintained political affinities with radical politics on the left wing and far left. Without a doubt, Marcel Duchamp's first use of mass-produced materials to create a work of art was his 1913 bicycle wheel. At this time, the artist was still in Paris and not using the term ready-made. According to Duchamp, quote, the word did not exist, the thought did not exist, end quote. Bicycle wheel is made up of a metal bicycle wheel mounted on a painted wooden stool. Marcel Duchamp described this creation by stating, quote, in 1913, I had the happy idea to fasten a bicycle wheel to a kitchen stool and watch it turn, end quote. <laughs> <laughs> For Duchamp's ready-mades, he deliberately chose functional everyday items, quote, based on a reaction of visual indifference, with at the same time a total absence of good and bad taste, end quote. <laughs> His second ready-made and first unaltered object came about in 1914 when Duchamp purchased a bottle dryer at the Bazaar de l'Hôtel de Ville department store in Paris, with the idea of installing it in his studio. In 1914, it bore no signature and no title, and the term ready-made had not been found. Both the bicycle wheel and the bottle dryer were left behind in Paris when Duchamp decided to center his life in New York in 1915 on account of the First World War, a war in which he did not fight because of a heart murmur. Both originals were never photographed or displayed, but instead were recreated by the artist later in life. In advance of the broken arm, the original, <laughs> the original of which has also been lost, is the first known object signed by Marcel Duchamp. He later recounted in life, quote, in New York in 1915, I bought at a hardware store a snow shovel on which I wrote in advance of the broken arm. It was around the time that the word ready-made came to mind to designate this form of manifestation, end quote. It becomes evident then that Duchamp's move from Paris to New York was a decisive factor in his terminology. Only in the US did he encounter the terminology of ready-made, pre-produced commodities, objects that can be placed and stored on a shelf for prospective buyers so that they didn't have to be made to order. The first time Duchamp presented objects designated as both art and ready-made was in April of 1916 when he entered two ready-mades into the exhibition of modern art at the bourgeois galleries. While we do not know which objects were on exhibition, evidently because they did not cause much of a stir, this moment is a monumental one because Duchamp is, for the first time, presenting a ready-made as an artistic work and not just a finished product in his studio. <laughs> the definitive moment in which the, mo the ready-made made itself known to the world was one year later in April of 1917. The New York Society of Independent Artists, of which Duchamp was a board member, decided to put on a jury-free art show in which no works of art would be rejected so long as the proper fee was paid for entry. <laughs> Thus, Duchamp purchased a standard Bedfordshire model urinal from JL Mott <laughs> Ironworks. The artist brought the urinal to his studio at 33 West 67th Street, reoriented it 90 degrees from its originally intended position of use, and wrote on it, Our Mutt, 1917. Duchamp elaborated, quote, Mutt comes from Mott Ironworks, the name of a large sanitary equipment manufacturer. But Mott was too close, so I altered it to Mutt after the daily cartoon strip Mutt and Jeff, which appeared at the time, with which everyone was familiar. I wanted any old name. I added Richard, French slang for money bags. That's not a bad name for a urinal, get it? The opposite of poverty. But not even that much, just our butt, end quote. <laughs> Fountain, which was submitted anonymously, was ultimately rejected by the society and placed behind a partition during the show, hidden from view. This work was not acknowledged as a ready-made, nor was it attributed to Marcel Duchamp at the time. This is evidenced by a letter from Miss Dreyer, a collector and art patron, who suggested to the president of the society, quote, that we invite Marcel Duchamp to lecture one afternoon in our free lecture hall on his ready-mades and have Richard Mutt bring the discarded object and explain the theory of art and why it had a legitimate place in an art exhibit. 
end quote. <laughs> Duchamp recovered the urinal and had Alfred Stieglitz, a leading photographer and gallery owner, capture the original. We must thank Stieglitz for documenting this extraordinary work as it was lost soon after. The image appeared in The Blind Man, a publication briefly published by New York Dadaist in 1917, <laughs> alongside an anonymous editorial that illustrates why exactly we recognize Fountain as one of the greatest works of art from the 20th century. They wrote, quote, Mr. Mutt's Fountain is not immoral. That is absurd. No more than a bathtub is immoral. It is a fixture that you see in everyday plumber shop windows. Whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain has no importance. He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life and placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view, created a new thought for that object, end quote. Here we see the birth of conceptual art, work that was in service of the mind as opposed to purely retinal art intended only to please the eye. In summary, ready-mades disrupted centuries of thinking for the artist's role as a skilled creator of original handmade objects. Instead, Duchamp argued that an ordinary object could be elevated to the dignity of an artwork by the mere choice of an artist. Duchamp claimed that he selected objects regardless of good or, of good or bad taste, defining the, mo defying the notion that art must be pleasing to the eye. Roaming within the circles of Marcel Duchamp was an artist who embraced the idea of the assisted ready-made. A term Duchamp coined to differentiate the original ready-made from those with more complex opponent, components, such as Duchamp's bicycle wheel, which we discussed previously. Man Ray, born Emmanuel Radinsky in South Philadelphia, two Russian Jewish immigrants, grew up in the Williamsburg neighborhood of Brooklyn, New York. He pursued artistic endeavors throughout his time in school and often visited museums to study the work of old masters. He sporadically attended art classes through his young adulthood, but never received much of formal training. While he spent some time in New York, meeting Alfred Stieglitz and Duchamp in the process, his mo most of his career was spent in Paris, where he moved in 1921. <laughs> Within a year, the artist had his first solo show at a Parisian gallery. Among the works he exhibited was one unlisted sculpture, the object, which he called the gift or cadeau in French. It was an everyday flat iron with brass tacks glued in a column down its center. According to Man Ray in his autobiography, Self Portrait, the object was made quickly in a bout of inspiration the day of the gallery opening. <laughs> Quote, a strange little man in his 50s came over to me and led me to one of my paintings. I was tired with the preparations of the opening. The gallery had no heat, and I shivered and said in English that I was cold. He replied in English, took my arm, and led me out of the gallery to a corner cafe where we ordered hot grogs. Introducing himself as Eric Satie, he relapsed into French, which I informed him I did not understand. <laughs> With a twinkle in his eye, he said it didn't matter. We had a couple of additional grogs. I began to feel warm and lightheaded. Leaving the cafe, we passed a shop that had various household utensils spread out front. I picked up the flat iron, the kind used in coal stoves, and asked Satie to come inside with me, where, with his help, I acquired a box of tacks and a tube of glue. Back at the gallery, I glued a row of tacks onto the smooth surface of the iron, titled it The Gift, and added it to the exhibition. This was the first Dada object in France. <laughs> with its menacing blend of domesticity and sadomasochism, the object apparently attracted unusual attention. By the end of the day, the gift had vanished. Cadeau, one of the most iconic works of the Dada and Surrealist movements, embodies the avant-garde volcano of art that erupted in 1916 as a reaction to the chaos, destruction, and mass slaughter of World War I. Man Ray and his close friend Duchamp emerged as early leaders of the Dada movement in New York and Paris. Their strange, disturbing objects expressing an ardent desire for absolute liberty or freedom of thought and action were key inspirations behind the founding of the Surrealist movement in the 20s. Cadeau perfectly fulfills the Surrealist aim of tapping into the subconscious world of dreams and irrational desire. By gluing a row of tacks onto the face of a hand iron, Man Ray transformed a common household tool into a nightmarish object. Deprived of its functionality and associations with domestic life, this perverse iron assumes disturbing associations with the world of irrational violence and sexual desire. This anti-art, anti-social nature completely contradicts the benign nature of a gift. Man Ray commented, 
that such objects were, quote, designed to amuse, annoy, bewilder, mystify, inspire reflection, but not to arouse admiration for any technical excellence usually sought or valued in objects classified as works of art. By anthropomorphizing ordinary domestic objects, he tapped meanings evoked by their forms, but also took advantage of the pre-coded cultural associations related to the use of the objects. The gift is physically and psychologically threatening. The flat iron is associated with women and their domestic role, but that role has been subversely altered and changed into something else. He could have chosen many things to attach to the iron to render it useless, but none perhaps more vindictive and ironic than his tax. His intention, therefore, was to intensify its dangerousness, not merely to negate its original function. The modification conjures images of clothing being ripped and shredded, a violation and a threatened assault of our most important physical and psychological barrier. As the outward manifestation of our own persona, clothing symbolizes our individuality and expresses our uniqueness by hiding what we have in common. In fact, Man Ray utilized this object to shred a dress donned by a young woman, an event in which he wrote, quote, you could tear a dress to ribbons with it. I did once and asked a beautiful girl to wear it as she danced. Her body showed through as she moved around. It was very beautiful, end quote. As Man Ray expressed, the ready-made was not meant to inspire aesthetic appreciation, but to challenge the viewer, his contemporaries, his audience, and the next generation. Another artist similarly wished to challenge the preconceived notions of what art could be. Andy Warhol, born Andrew Warhol Jr., was an American artist, director, producer, and leading figure of the pop art movement. He was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania to Austro-Hungarian immigrants and grew up drawing and writing. When entering college, he had the intention of studying art education at the University of Pittsburgh, but ultimately ended up attending Carnegie Mellon University for commercial art. After graduating, he moved to New York to start a career in magazine illustration and advertising. Scholars like Stephen Goldsmith have argued that without Duchamp's experiments, quote, it is likely that the pop art celebration of everyday objects might have never occurred, end quote. Warhol, an admirer of Duchamp, was most famous for his recreations of everyday objects that are elevated to the status of art by the hand of the object, the hand of the artist, excuse me. While his work is not classified as true ready-mades, objects that are already in existence and reclassified as art, he takes the idea of the ready-made and refines it as a conceptual art to be consumed by the masses. The perfect example of Warhol's use of the ready-made concept is the Brillo box. Brillo boxes were precise replicas of the commercial packaging of Brillo pads. In the mid-1960s, Warhol employed carpenters to create numerous plywood boxes that were identical in size and shape to the boxes found in supermarkets across the country. With the assistance of his studio assistants at the time, Warhol painted and silkscreened the boxes with different consumer labels and product logos. These included Kellogg's Corn Flakes, Mott's Apple Juice, Del Monte Peaches, and Heinz Ketchup. The completed sculptures closely resembled the cardboard supermarket items to the point of being nearly indistinguishable. Warhol chose an existing mass-produced item and expanded the scale of the production by creating his own soap bag cases. All the while, the Brillo company was also manufacturing their own. In 1964, Warhol initially showcased these sculptures at the Stable Gallery, filling the space with neatly stacked boxes reminiscent of a crowded grocery warehouse. He encouraged collectors to purchase them in stacks, but they didn't sell well, sparking controversy. <laughs> Warhol later explained that he aimed for something commonplace with his boxes, which ironically provoked the ire of critics. Eleanor Ward, a stable gallery art dealer, wrote, quote, the boxes were very difficult to sell. He thought that everyone was gonna buy them on site. He really truly did. We had visions of people walking down at Madison Avenue with these boxes under their arms, but we never saw them, end quote. Warhol caused fundamental questions to resurface, so brilliantly posed by Arthur Danto. How is it possible for something to be a work of art when something else, which resembles it to whatever degree of exactitude, is merely a thing or an artifact, but not an artwork? Why is Brillo box art when the Brillo cartons at the warehouse are merely soap pad containers? For an answer, we may return to Art Mutt. Quote, whether Mr. Mutt with his own hands made the fountain has no importance. 
He chose it. He took an ordinary article of life and placed it so that its useful significance disappeared under the new title and point of view and created a new thought for that object. Warhol precisely replicates not only the Brillo boxes, but the spirit of the Dada movement. Whether or not Warhol made the boxes with his own hands has no importance of his classification as a ready-made. He took a mass-produced object, chose it, and reframed it as a work of art. All useful context disappears when the work is placed in a gallery. Another, living, another artist living and working around the same time as Warhol embraced the idea of the ready-made throughout his entire career and body of work. Felix Gonzalez Torres, born November 26, 1957 in Cuba, identified himself as an American. He resided and worked in New York City from 1979 to 1995 before he tragically passed away in Miami due to AIDS-related causes. He initiated his art education at the University of Puerto Rico before relocating to New York City, where he participated in the Whitney Independent Study Program in both 1981 and 1983. He earned his BFA from Pratt Institute New York in 1983 and later completed his MFA at the International Center of Photography in New York University in 1987. Gonzalez Torres' work is often described as images that describe a society in crisis. And in fact, many of his works grapple with the ideas of death, loss, memorials, and public policy. Told through seemingly everyday objects, Torres uses imagery of the world around him to express the struggles of himself, the world, and his community. The first of Gonzalez Torres' ready-mades that I'll cover this evening is Untitled, March 5th, number two. This work depicts two nestling light bulbs hanging from intertwined cords. At first glance, this object may not seem like much, but upon further examination, we know that this piece represents a dark truth about our reality, that one partner, or bulb, will inevitably burn out before the other. According to the artist's wishes, the light bulb is to be replaced upon extinguishing, perhaps giving hope to the viewer that their own light will not go out forever. This work may also be a reference to the AIDS epidemic that ravaged the gay community in the 80s and 90s. The second ready-made we will discuss by Gonzalez Torres is Untitled Perfect Lovers. The piece consists of a pair of identical commercial wall clocks placed side by side, positioned closely together as if they were touching. Ideally, they are installed above eye level, mirroring the typical placement of wall clocks. The original clocks each have a diameter of 13 and a half inches. It is essential that the clocks match precisely in terms of dimension and design. Initially, both clocks must be synchronized to display the same time. However, during the course of an exhibition, they may naturally drift out of synchronization. If either or both of the clocks cease to function, they will be removed, repaired, and then reinstalled with their time reset to match each other once more. This process ensures that the artwork can theoretically endure indefinitely. While once again, the meaning of the work is ambiguous, we can assume based on the title that the clocks were meant to represent two lovers. Of this piece, Gonzalez Torres wrote to Ross Laycock, his lover. Don't be afraid of the clocks. They are our time. The time has been so generous to us. We imprinted time with the sweet taste of victory. We conquered fate by meeting at a certain time in a certain space. We are a product of the time. Therefore, we give that credit where credit is due, time. We are synchronized now and forever. I love you. The artwork can be seen as a form of protest against the suppression of gay art. It acknowledges the, ch the challenge critics would face arguing that funds are being used to endorse homosexual art when the, process is so, when the artwork is so minimalistic and abstract in its essence. According to Sean Diamond, the creation of this piece served as a way to commemorate the love shared between Gonzalez Torres and Laycock. Gonzalez Torres himself described the process of making the work as the scariest thing I have ever done. The final works that I will address by Gonzalez Torres are perhaps the most well-known of his work. A manifestation of untitled Portrait of Ross in LA consists of a, connect a collection of individually wrapped candies and assorted colored wrappers. Viewers are allowed to select a piece of candy from the artwork, and it is noted that there is an indefinite supply of candies available. <laughs> <laughs> 
The specific type of candy used in presenting the artwork, the initial arrangement chosen, and the overall size and shape of the particular presentation of the artwork are determined by the exhibitor. These candies displays have been showcased as rectangular carpets of candies, piled in corners of exhibition spaces, arranged organically across the floor, or formed into mounds on the ground, among other configurations. Although the ideal of weight of the artwork remains consistent, the actual weight of the candies employed to represent the artwork is in constant flux. The quantity of candy changes as the viewers select candy from the artwork, whether or not the candy is diminished or is replaced throughout an exhibition. The ideal weight of 175 pounds is a reference to Ross's healthy weight, which faltered because of the virus. Gonzalez Torres spoke to another work that diminishes as it is viewed. Maybe not. Slide. <laughs> I wanted people to have my work. In a way, this is letting go of the artwork, the refusal to make a static form, a monolithic sculpture in favor of a disappearing, changing, unstable, and fragile form was an attempt on my part to rehearse my fears of Ross disappearing day by day right in front of my eyes. Slide. In conclusion, the ready-made is an extremely diverse genre of art that has a rich history that it continues to expand today. I hope that my talk has provided a satisfying sampling of the bountiful examples of ready-mades throughout art history. Thank you. And again, thank you all so much Wait, for coming out. Oh. oh. We'll go ahead and take questions now. <laughs> Are you good questions? Yes. Where do you think ready-made art is going currently today? That's an excellent question. Um, the piece that I've selected here is actually from the Venice Biennale uh, from this past year. Um, this is Lauren Yeager's work, um, which she goes around Cleveland and collects uh, trash that she sees on the side of the street and assembles it into ready-made sculptures. Um, so I think we're chugging along. <laughs> um, you know, with the idea of, um, you know, environmental destruction, I think a lot of people are like thinking more about litter and uh, maybe that can be used more towards writing names. Absolutely. And I just like the big exhibit here at the Valley Arts Center. It's perfect. I was walking around with Julie. I was like, this is nothing but assisted ready names. <laughs> Yes. I was thinking about watching the works of Duchamp. Mm -hmm. Did this author and his correspondence with other people or conversations that other people might have heard ever hint that he was making fun of the art world? And that Absolutely. Maybe, and also, <laughs> I think of the critic saying, this is the greatest work of modern art. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with the debates that go around the Comic Sans font? <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs> am. Horrible, Intensely familiar. <laughs> like, is it making fun of typography or yeah. not? Right. Yes. And, and I'm wondering if in any of these artists there was any hint in their cor private correspondence, which mm -hmm. doesn't end up being private after they're right. doing it after a while, that they were like pulling people's legs a little bit. I mean, it's, it's very interesting how your comment about how it presents a dissonance mm -hmm. that then evokes your feelings and thoughts about why it's there. And even in the lab case with the person who's the incandescent novel on that mm -hmm. pole, you think, why is this there? Well, that's it. That's just what it was doing. Right. And mm -hmm. I was thinking of, uh, so. I absolutely think you're yeah. correct about um, making fun of art in a way because, you know, uh, the fountain, he submitted it to an exhibition that was allegedly jury-free, that everything was going to be accepted no matter what. And he thinks, okay, I'm going to put a urinal in it. Let's see if like people really want to put their money where their mouth is. Um, so yeah, I absolutely believe he's poking fun. Um, when it comes to Gonzalez Torres, I think his work might be a little more sincere. It seems that um, he was just working with the world around him as a way to express himself. Uh, but Duchamp certainly had some mischievous intentions. <laughs> Guys, if you would ask the questions in the microphone, it's going to oh, make a much better yeah. presentation. Official. <laughs> <laughs> Don't. Karaoke, anyone? Yeah. Um, I, just, I just wanted to say, you know, um, 
when you when you put something on a pedestal or in a frame or whatever, I think it, you know, your mind, at least for me, I think, you know, somebody did design that. Mm -hmm. An artist did design the bakas, the, you know, whatever, the coolers, the stuff. So I think, uh, or the bicycle wheel, mm -hmm. I mean, that's an amazing I know, design. You think about so I almost design, feel, industrial. even though I'm aware, you know, that they were, you know, goofing around and such, and had tomatoes thrown at them and such, <laughs> I still feel like it does make us think that, oh, wait a minute, an artist did it in, invent or create that object. And when you put it in a frame or up on a pet or an easel, whatever, you know, it's like your mind automatically thinks of it as a work of art, which in most cases it is. Absolutely. Yes. And I think that Duchamp might have been even thinking the same thing when he writes our mutt on the side yeah. as a reference back to J.L. Mott Ironworks because they designed it. It's an industrial design piece. Someone thought of the aesthetics and the functionality of the object. And although he may not be giving credit where credit is due, I think, you know, as the viewer, we can respect um, the design choices of the artist. I mean, if anybody in here is a fan of American Pickers, you know, <laughs> they go in and they, you know, and I'm, you know, steel workers, you know, designing these molds and they're gorgeous and, mm -hmm. you know. Absolutely. I agree. No judging. <laughs> actually a traditional painter. <clears throat> but in my retirement years, I have taken up, and actually before my retirement years, I always had fun making things out of something else. Mm -hmm. Like, there used to be a lumber company over on East Washington, Hancock Lumber, and I would go into by uh, 20 pounds of cement. And Mr. Hancock would say, okay, now what are you making? <laughs> now this was be, this has actually come back. I've seen these uh, in stores now, but no one saw them before. I made mushrooms. And um, <laughs> now I am a member of the Children's Guild of Cleveland where we're crafters. Mm -hmm. And we make things out of something else, you know, a, a found object. And like this year, I've made Santas out of toilet brushes. You know, we, <laughs> we try, and I think it's sort of like Dadaism. We're doing something humorous that is meaningless out of something else. Absolutely. And I always stirred cement with my husband's screwdriver. <laughs> Uh-oh, I'm sure he was happy about that. <laughs> All right, and we'll do one more question. Anyone? Just a clarification. It's not really a question, a clarification. At the end of uh, talking about Man Ray's gift, Absolutely. you said that he negated the original function, and then there was something right before that mm -hmm. where my idea of light bulb went off, but I can't remember what it was. Should I turn back? Yeah. <laughs> Let's see. You took something inoffensive and made it offensive or something? Right. Non-violent and made it violent. Yeah. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Well, something that is could be violent inherently and made it more, more dangerous. Violent. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I think, too, that spurred me to feel that women are very resourceful. They're given an iron like that. They're going to figure out how to use it. Absolutely. We'll cut a line down the middle of the ironing board and just go to the flow. <laughs> you know? So I think that has a lot to do with like women are very resourceful, and we're going to figure it out. I think so, too. I find that piece very empowering. Yeah. yeah. Good, good girl. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. So I want to go ahead again and thank everybody so much for coming out. Please, I'm going to talk into this microphone right here. Um, thank you all so much for coming out. Uh, I would love for you guys to go ahead and grab some more refreshments, grab some more wine, and then take a look at Contemporary Debris, the exhibition which is made out of all recycled materials and assisted ready-mades.